Hello again, I'm John Brewer, and this is Space Engineers Exploration Survival 201. Since I concluded Large Ship Combat 101 last year, Keen Software House, the developers of Space Engineers, have released Exploration Mode. Rather than having a small grouping of relatively close asteroids, Exploration Mode allows you to play in a field of asteroids about 6.6 .6 astronomical units across. That means that the exploration worlds in Space Engineers are about the size of our solar system's asteroid belt, although the distribution is rather denser. Given that at maximum speed it would take just shy of 300 years to fly from one end of the world to the other, these worlds are effectively unlimited for play purposes. The sheer size and scope of an exploration world offers a variety of new challenges to the enterprising space engineer. We're going to cover some of those challenges in this series, along with the in-depth analysis of the game's mechanics you've come to expect from this channel. To help drive home how and why you'd want to use some of these tips, I've invited a few friends along to play through a survival exploration game with me from scratch. Our initial world is empty, and has a low asteroid density. We're starting with a basic respawn ship. The respawn ship is critical, because without both an assembler and a refinery, we won't be able to build anything else. The respawn ship is a tenuous gift, though. If I die or disconnect from the server, it and anything we've stored or built on it will disappear from the world. So before I log out this session, we need to find a new home, dismantle the respawn ship, and establish our new base of operations. In this episode, we're going to be covering the first step, finding a new home. To do that, we need to start prospecting this asteroid field. Our first destination is a pair of toroidal asteroids we call the Double Donut. To build the vast majority of blocks, you only need five minerals. Iron, nickel, cobalt, silicon, and gold. Iron we need in tremendous quantity, but nearly every asteroid contains large amounts of it. So what we're looking for in a new home is large deposits of the other four elements. In order, nickel, cobalt, silicon, and gold. Because we require relatively little silicon and even less gold by volume, we can afford to make trips to nearby asteroids to get those materials, but we really want at least four of these five key materials available wherever we call home. I'll be staying with the ship at the Double Donut, while my colleagues head to nearby asteroids to scout them. The Double Donut itself contains plenty of iron, a lot of nickel, and silicon too. It doesn't have any cobalt or gold that we can find, so it won't make a good home for our new base. After 20 minutes of searching nearby asteroids, both our searchers come up empty-handed. So we install a pair of chairs in the respawn ship and head to another site. One of the great challenges when you're prospecting is identifying which asteroids you've already been to. In our case, with a team of people, it was also important for our scouts to be able to return to the ship when they had finished examining a prospect. If you find a great home, but you and your team can't find each other and return to it, it does you very little good. Suit radios are only good to 200 meters, and the respawn ship isn't equipped with a beacon or an antenna, so we need to find some solution for navigating between asteroids. Fortunately, we have the same tool to navigate mariners have used for millennia, the sky. All of the stars in Space Engineer's skybox are fixed, and we have full view of the sky at all times. Seeing the sky doesn't give us any idea of our location, but it lets us find a particular direction relative to ourselves, no matter where we are. Before we have rotors to build sites, we can't get exact readings, but we can still use the features of the skybox to get approximate directions. The first trick is orientation, finding an easily discernible reference direction we measure everything else from. The easiest way to choose a primary direction is to find the brightest object in the sky. For us, the sun is a perfectly serviceable reference point, since it doesn't move through the sky in Space Engineers. If, like sailors, we were navigating on a two-dimensional surface, that would be enough to define a direction. But since we're in three space in Space Engineers, we also need to know which way is up. Any reference point will do, but I find the five-star constellation near the sun to be a great up direction, as it's relatively obvious and fits on the same screen as the sun in 16 by 9 aspect ratios. Using these two points together gives us a direction and a plane of reference. If we had a site, we could express a course to a nearby asteroid, station, or anything else as an azimuth and a direction off of this plane, but we don't have any instrumentation this early in the game. Instead, we can use an approximation using the edges of the screen. This method takes advantage of the fact that the screen is about 90 degrees wide and about 60 degrees tall. By starting with our crosshair on the sun, 
We can choose a star on either the center left or the center right of the screen. Keeping our eye on the star we chose, we turn until it is lined up with the crosshair vertically. We are now pointing 45 degrees to the side of the sun. If we turn until the star is on the opposite side of the screen, we have turned 90 degrees. Likewise, we can find a star at the top of the screen and look up until it reaches the same line as the crosshair. Now we've turned up 30 degrees. If we track that same star down to the bottom of the screen, we've turned 60 degrees up. By just using these 45 degree azimuth and 30 degree elevation increments, we can provide ourselves with 42 distinct and easily findable directions in the sky. By pairing these with a description of the destination, such as two spherical asteroids close to each other, or a big donut asteroid, we can usually provide another person with enough information to identify the asteroid we're talking about. Likewise, when we reach the asteroid we've referred to, the way home is simply the reciprocal heading. Add 180 degrees to both the azimuth and the elevation, and you'll have the direction from the destination asteroid back to your beginning point. By specifying a starting point and a direction, we can at least give vague directions to various asteroids. But to really start mapping the asteroid field, we need to know how far apart two asteroids are. Before we can build antennas and beacons, how do we do that? There's a second process we'll steal from ancient navigators, called dead reckoning. We know how fast our ship accelerates and how fast it decelerates. If we time how long it takes to fly at top speed from one asteroid to another, we can calculate how far we've traveled. If we find the total thrust of our ship's forward engines by counting up the rear-facing thrusters, we can figure out exactly how fast the ship accelerates. If we know how fast the ship can get to top speed, 104.4 meters per second by default, we can simply multiply that time by 104.4 and divide by 2 to get the distance the ship travels while accelerating. Because of the complicated way in which inertial dampeners slow ships down with enhanced thrust, I generally suggest manually stopping the ship, or at least carefully measuring the deceleration time. We can calculate the distance covered while stopping the same way we calculated the distance covered while starting. One half of the stopping times times 104.4 meters per second. Now we know how long we took starting, and how long we took stopping. We subtract the accelerating time and the decelerating time from the total trip time, to get the amount of time we were just cruising along at full speed. We multiply our cruise speed of 104.4 times the number of seconds we were traveling, and we get the distance we cruised. Sum up the accelerating distance, the cruise distance, and the decelerating distance, and we get the total distance between the two asteroids. If you're careful, this number will usually be accurate within a kilometer or two. Far from perfect, but good enough to help you find your way around while you're looking for a good home. Speaking of which, we should get back to our team currently searching for a new place to live. Departing the double donut, our ship weighs in at 158,128 kilograms, and its four thrusters generate 400,000 newtons of thrust. That means we're accelerating at a bit over 2.5 meters per second per second. We'll reach top speed in around 41 seconds, over about 2,140 meters. We only have two thrusters on the front, so it'll take twice as long and twice as far to stop. Because of that reduced stopping power, I used the inertial dampeners and stopped the ship in 10 seconds instead of 82. The trip to Prospect Site 7, called Billiards, took about 129 seconds total. When we subtract the 41 seconds accelerating and the 10 seconds decelerating, we had 78 seconds of cruising time, during which we flew about 8,140 meters. Adding up all three phases of flight, we can determine that the double donut and billiards are about 10,800 meters from each other, or nearly 11 kilometers. Our team prospects billiards, finds iron and cobalt, but no nickel or silicon, so we load back up into the ship and we try again. This time our flight to prospect site 8, Hart, is 119 seconds. Again, I used the inertial dampeners to stop in 10 seconds over 520 meters or so. The practical upshot is that I spent 2,140 meters accelerating, 7,100 meters cruising, and 520 meters stopping. I did stop a kilometer or two short of the asteroid though, so we'll call the total distance about 12,000 meters. We prospected Site 8, and after finding iron, nickel, silicon, cobalt, and some magnesium to boot, we decided that home truly is where the heart is. We renamed the asteroid Beachhead, and begin the slow task of dismantling the ship and building a base. Come back for our next episode, in which we begin the delicate task of dismantling the respawn ship, and a terrible accident befalls one of our crew.
Until then, I'm John Brewer, bringing you better gaming through applied mathematics.